Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And whether you're a multifamily investor, or aspiring investor, or if you just love the idea of creating passive income and generational wealth, well, you know, just get ready to go because we have a heck of an episode for you today. We're doing another Gray Report recap, kind of rounding up everything that happened this week in the multifamily industry, commercial real estate, real estate in the economy. Um, we're going to be getting into it. What are the latest research reports, articles, original content that came out this week? And again, if you didn't, if you didn't read the news and do anything, that's all right. We're going to bring you right up to speed. We're going to be bringing Matt Bosnoggle, um, the Director of Communications and Marketing from Great Capital, back in today. He's the one that puts these newsletters together. Um, he's got a very good uh, pulse on what's going on in the market, in the economy. But first, just a quick word from our sponsor. This week's episode is sponsored by GreyReport.com, the premier multifamily research and intelligence website developed by Gray Capital. It's essentially a, uh, it's a process from the Gray Report newsletter. It's now on the web at grayreport.com, bringing you the latest research reports, articles, original content, videos, podcasts, market updates, updated throughout the day. So not just once a week, but every single day, 24 hours, constantly being updated. It's a brand new um, product from Gray Capital. It's grayreport.com. So you don't have to be going across the internet finding you know, different sources, where are these research articles? We've got them in one place at grayreport.com. It's just in a soft launch right now. So go check it out. Let us know what you think. That's grayreport.com. All right, without any further ado, let's bring Matt into the conversation. Matt, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Well, let's get right into the great report newsletter. Um, a lot of exciting stuff going on in the market. You know, we've been talking about inflation pretty consistently, as is everybody that's I know featured in the report as well. Um, you know, for just the beginning, you know, no slowdown on horizon. Matt, can you give us a kind of a quick summary? What's the theme of today's newsletter? What is what's happening? Um, there are pe people are buying more rents are going up prices are going up uh, still a lot of uh, a lot of the similar trends from last week and really the week before um, and uh, with this it's it's getting more and more um, more and more apparent that uh, that people don't know when this is going to end um, it's it I think it's kind of striking that there's very little discussion of when this froth in the market may settle down um, for the long-term horizon, uh, people you, people see kind of a settling and and see and see things see a very good a strong recovery. But um, in the near term, employment numbers are a little rocky. Um, there's some uncertainty in the office market and other vulnerable sectors. But <clears throat> especially um, for multifamily, it's really been a bull market. Um, there's been a lot of buyers and and prices are going up. Um, and this isn't just in the commercial real estate market, really. You know, if we're talking inflation, we're talking broader economy too. So, but um, it is specifically being felt, I think, in the in the multifamily market. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like it's really, uh, and I think that was a good point. It's not just multifamily. It's not just real estate. It's it's all things. The prices of everything is going up, and you know, it, it reminds me a little bit about um, almost like the two thousand. 12, 2013 time where, you know, we were still feeling the effects from the great financial crisis. And just, it was hard to be confident saying, you know, the future is absolutely bright just because we've had all this, um, you know, volatility and, and yeah. insanity recently. It's hard to say with certainty because everyone wants to be cautious and what they want to, um, they don't want to say everything's going to be fine and then not be fine. Um, but, you know, looking at most of, um, you know, actual things that are happening, We've got a lot to be hopeful for, so yeah. But we, we we shall see. Okay, let's do a quick review of snapshot the snapshot of rates and markets. Um, the ten year Treasury yield um, that's a, up a little bit, clocking at one point six four percent. You know, it's been hovering in that kind of one point five to one point six range. Um, I believe this one point six four. That's um, you know we're we're close to the peak that we had you know back in march march 21st you know we dipped back down mm -hmm. close to that 1.5 level and you know we're we're creeping back up um but really for you know 
you know, we had new CPI data that came out yesterday. Um, you know, look like we're clocking in close to 4%, um, you know, 3 to 4% inflation right now or CPI growth. Um, you know, so for the 10 year, just to kind of be sitting here around that 1.6, you know, it's right at 1.674 um, this morning on Thursday at 10 a.m. Um, so, you know, that'll be, it'll be interesting to track where the 10 year treasury goes. And we've got some reports with some surveys on where folks think uh, interest rates are going to go, but that certainly is the topic of conversation because as you know, if interest rates rise, that's going to bring a lot of these lofty valuations down um, significantly. So third, yeah, yes. So go ahead, Matt. Oh no, I I think that the interest rates are are especially kind of interesting because this is this is what people would uh, they were talking about. You know, interest rates will go up when uh, it's kind of tied to employment. And uh, the con <clears throat> the conditions of employment, if if the interest rates are driving, are still made to, you know, keeping employment numbers high, or uh, or if there's still a need to kind of goose employment through this, these lower interest rates, that's that's what I've heard, and that's it seems like hopefully <laughs> the answer's already there, um, and we won't really see higher interest rates until the employment conditions re return. Well, at least yeah, on the Fed funds rate and the this lower, uh, shorter maturity bonds. I mean, yeah, because the Fed, I mean, they're they want to see unemployment back to you know pre-pandemic levels, and, and we again, we're actually at pre-pandemic levels in terms of unemployment, at least in where in the state we are at. We're in Indiana, we're back at pre-pandemic unemployment levels. Um, but you know, they're also shooting for that target of two percent average inflation yeah. versus um, just shooting for a two percent on the dot, which. You know, ended up being more of a ceiling. They didn't want to exceed two percent, but I think you know we're over two percent right now. So how long are they going to let that run hotter yeah. to really spur the economy at the risk of overheating itself? So, so in terms of the short term um, uh, uh, rates that we track, LIBOR and SOFR, actually the LIBOR's come down just slightly. Yeah. Um, and SOFR, it, it's unchanged again. So LIBOR is at 0.09%. SOFR is at 0.01%. So essentially zero. Uh, 10 year treasury minus a two year spread that's clocking in at 1.53%. Um, HUD interest rates for the 223F clocking in at 2.5%. HUD 221D4, these are the new construction loans, those 40 year AM loans, three and a quarter percent. Um, you know, Fannie and Freddie, um, you know, Matt, are they, do you know if these are fixed, are these fixed, what, seven year rates? Do you know? They're 10 year. 10 year. Okay. So, yeah. You know, Fannie and Freddie are right in lockstep at three percent. And again, the, this is kind of a uh, an average because you know, there's a lot of different agency product. Fannie and Freddie, five, seven, ten, twelve years floating, fixed, a lot of different options. Fannie and Freddie, but you know, we're shooting around that three percent mark. Probably a little bit higher if it's a fixed product. Maybe a little lower if it's a floating. Um, the FDSC Nareet Equity Apartments. It's at four sixty nine. Gold at eighteen hundred and sixteen dollars. Gold is up right now. Gold has been, you know, lagging really, really compared to a lot of commodities. If you see back in July, we had a major run up in gold, kind of peaked in August. Then we've been kind of on a slow decline. But ever since March, things have tricked up, trickled up, um, which is interesting. You know, a lot of people like to see gold as a hedge against inflation. Um, others see it really just as a hedge against risk. Um, and there's a lot of arguments or opinions, of people saying there's more flows into cryptocurrency rather than gold, if you're looking to make that specific trade. All right, now in terms of uh, steel, steel's at 1519 and lumber, um, you know, lumber's actually come down slightly, not a lot, but um, it has come down off of its, off of its highs, but still extremely, extremely um, elevated. I'll just go back here. So, you know, we peaked yeah. over, these are the future contracts. You know, we peaked at 1667 and we're down, you know, closer to 1537. So, I mean, you know, thank God it's not going, you know, fully, well, it's already gone parabolic, but we're not continuing that climb because again, that was becoming quite insane. Crude oil, uh, you know, crude oil has been going up quite a bit. Um, you know, gasoline, here, let's go back to a wider chart. You know, gasoline, um, if you read the BLS's CPI um, release yesterday at the Consumer Price Index, um, gasoline prices um, year over year are up 49%. And so obviously you can see that also in the oil charts themselves. 
Um, so it's, uh, it's, again, it's another one of those cases for, you know, how is that going to translate to other prices throughout the economy? And I guess, you know, something to mention is the, you know, the whole pipeline hack that happened, um, on the East coast today, that ransomware attack that's added another huge supply crunch to the market. I mean, it's more regional, but I mean, we don't, we don't need any more supply crunches. Um, and I've also heard, yeah. It's also, I thought that was interesting. Like that supply crunch got people, got people talking about oil and then, or gasoline specifically, but then you hear that there's probably going to be, the prices are are probably going to rise anyways. Like this, it wasn't just, it's not going to be the the crunch that causes it. Yeah. It was already on the rise. I know some markets were, you know, already in the, you know, 350 to $4 range. I mean, I, on my way, my drive in today, um, you know, I think regular is at like $3. And so where is that, you know, closer to $2 last year. So that definitely is impactful, but like also we went, you know, that 49% increase from compared to last year, we also have to remind ourselves the last year no, around this time period, no one was really driving st- still. Yeah. Everyone was staying at home. And so we kind of have to take a lot of these year over year numbers with a grain of salt, right? I mean, even the CPI data is like, you know, last year, yeah, you would expect, I mean, we had that mass, I think about 30% drop in GDP is well, everyone stopped doing stuff. So yeah, it, it does make sense to, you know, a certain degree. All right. Um, let's just quickly look at the crypto markets, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, Tesla announced yesterday that they were no longer going to accept Bitcoin as payment for um, their Tesla vehicles. That has uh, sent a little bit of, you know, negative shockwaves around the, the crypto markets as, you know, and I think a lot of frustration of how much power Elon Musk has. Um, he can basically just mention or do something with any kind of cryptocurrency and it just moves it significantly, whether that's Dogecoin or Bitcoin. So, but, you know, Bitcoin is not seen as much, um, you know, gains as recent Ethereum and other tokens and coins have outpaced it. It's been relatively flat um, over the past couple of weeks. Um, Ethereum, not as much. there has been growing quite a bit, um, but also, um, you know, it's correlated to the broader crypto market. And so it has seen some declines um, with that announcement from Tesla itself. And lastly, the S&P 500 coming in at uh, $4,063, um, 406 on the SPY itself. So, you know, we're not at all time highs, but we are... Well, we're, we're, we're pretty close to it. Um, yeah. I mean, just just look at this growth. I mean, this is a this is from, you know, this is a multi-year chart. This is obviously the pandemic. We've seen a lot of growth, a little bit of softness recently. I mean, there's been a major sell-off um, and rotation out of technology um, stocks um, in general. A huge, I mean, there's been an entire market cycle really in the past four months in terms of in the stock market from value stocks um, into value stocks out of technology stocks. You can see that in the S&P 500. S&P 500 is heavily weighted um, to uh, technology, um, but I think even more of an example is um, Kathy Wood's ARK Investments ETF. This is the innovation ETF, highly focused on technology. And it is just, you know, it was a high flyer last year in the pandemic. Yeah. And, you know, just just look at that, it's gone through quite a tough time um, so far this year in 2021. So this can't be the semiconductor shortage. This is something no. bigger. No, no, yeah. This is this is a rotation, a secular rotation out of technology yeah. stocks um, into value stocks. Um, part of it is the rise in interest rates affecting valuations. A fact, uh, another, just a lot of value stocks. Um, you just do better in a more inflationary environment. I mean, apartments do better in an inflationary environment, even though they did well in a deflationary environment the last 10 years. Um, but, you know, they're going into more, you know, industrials, um, you know, commodities. And again, things that just maybe track inflation a little bit more and not, um, you know, just so focused on on growth and valuations. Because again, just all these valuations are, um, they're correlated to uh, the 10-year treasury in terms of, um, you know, what kind of multiple they're getting on mm. those on those valuations themselves. Okay, let's get right into the the kind of the meat of the report let's get into some of the articles the economy and the multifamily market matt what do you want to um discuss first yeah you can see that big fat bowl <laughs> on the uh on the picture that i the that i used for um 
for that for this section because it that this is really what has seemed to characterize uh, at least the CRE market and, and the multifamily market specifically um, for the past really oh gosh few months really. Um, as this recovery goes and people kind of scramble towards uh, scramble towards these assets. Um, I think that inflation is is still a much discussed in, and, and rightly so. Um, I also think that th uh, that the apartment rents rising is a, is a very good story and it's another one that um, that kind of reemphasizes the value that's in multifamily and um, and just as on kind of like a specific note within our company, I know that we, you know, we have that we're pursuing a few deals and 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 it's in this stage where we're we're trying to figure out the best price and the seller's trying to, you know, the seller wants the highest price. And and I and I read articles about the the bull market and it makes me want to shout over next door <laughs> and tell and and tell uh, and tell our team to bid higher and higher and higher <laughs> because I don't know, I don't know when when the market is going to cool down. This is what I said up top is what is the limit of this bull market? When is it going to kind of tip over into kind of into more realistic numbers? Um, because if we're outbid, that if we're outbid and then the market if, and those prices keep going up, then um, yeah, then it, and it's disappointing. Yeah, it's tough because it's like, are we in 2006 or are we in 2013? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, neither obviously but um you know we just got out of a technical recession but to, you know you can have a double dip we could have another recession but you know looking back at history you know we're gonna we one would most likely see another um you know five plus years of another run um just kind of based on the average bull market um but it, but you know who knows again we're in uncharted territory um there's been a lot of probably uh, malinvestment, investment. There's a lot of money that's you know, been sloshing around um, that the government's been you know, creating. Uh, people have just been spending. So yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a big question of where we are. And we, we always have to balance on one hand, you know, the fundamentals of the multifamily market are, are such that you know, one can make the argument, you could essentially go out and buy just about anything and because there's just so little supply especially in that kind of that b class c class segment there's just no new supply and there's going to be no new supply coming online outside of the newer products that kind of you know depreciate down um that you could buy just about anything and it's going to continue to increase in value but you know we, we can't that's pure speculation and we can't we can't necessarily yeah. buy on that but you know there is that feeling there of you know the fundamentals are kind of setting us up for continued growth but um you know we've, we've got to buy on cash flow and put get some cash flow as well we're not just you know speculating and, and trade and trading these things um so yeah, but it, yeah. it's, it's that's of, why i'm not making those decisions but it's still but it's still interesting about you know if someone's bidding you up so by so much such a higher percentage what are, what is their motivation and, and that that's unsustainable. You can't, you know, the next person can't go 20 or 30 or 40, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so you just don't want to buy at the top is, is basically. And that's my, the, my that's fear. the fear. You don't want to buy at the top, but at the same time, I mean, we, we were saying that two years ago or three years ago, and you know, we're looking at the same, the same properties that are valued, like you said, 10 to 20% more. So it's tough, but yeah, how long can that keep going? Um, since, since we really didn't have the the correction um, or the mean reversion during the you know the twenty twenty recession, um, yeah, if you can call it that. So. I think the most interesting un unanswered question is what would have happened if if it weren't for the pandemic? Some people say that we were headed towards a recession, anyways, um, and and how much of a return to normalcy is going to factor in what would have happened if it weren't for? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, if because we were, I mean, the 10, 10 year trade, I mean, the yield curve inverted, um, yep. you know, and we were seeing all, all the signs of inflation. I mean, we were seeing, you know, rent growth, um, you know, slow down, we're seeing prices slow down, we're seeing issues in the stock market slow down, a lot of issues in the system that were pointing towards some kind of recession. And then did the pandemic just trigger it and we got through it faster and just time just compressed and now the recovery is compressed. 
No, yeah. so so does that mean now are we in kind of a normal time frame now, or are we at this are we in this time compressed reality now where we could see another recession instead of five years, maybe it's two years instead of ten, yeah. maybe it's five. Um, so it, it it begs the question, and like we mentioned last week, you know, we always want to say, you know, the joke of this time is different. It's not actually different, but you know, it seems like this time is different. That being said, it's but the cycles aren't necessarily different. They've just compressed over time. So like the cycles still exist, but we're just they're just ha- taking place in a fraction of the time, just like we've seen in this kind of this tech um, decline and this value rotation. You know that could have taken a, you know over a year, two year period, but it's taken place over the past couple of months. Not that it hasn't turned around yet, um, but it, it's it's interesting to. Yeah say the least. Um, and so, you know, we've got a couple of articles here part, uh, from Globe Street Department rents rose last month at fastest pace seen in a decade. Um, you know, that's what we're seeing that in our markets as well. Um, we're kind of seeing anywhere between five to 8% rent growth. A lot of our properties, um, you know, on renewals, we're you know, usually doing 5% increases because that's what the competition is doing. We are seeing wages rise. Um, and we're just, again, just seeing continued pressure um, in demand, um, we're, we're our, yeah. a lot most of our assets are at peak occupancy right now, outside of really one downtown asset. Um, so, I want to note um, briefly the the employment numbers that Marcus and Millichap have uh, d- talked about in their in their little re- research brief. Um, I think it's very interesting how. Uh, how it lines up with a little bit of the story of the office market and that we can kind of go in um, into the future. But um, leisure and hospitality have uh, have really made a lot of a lot of progress, um, a lot more job growth in leisure and hospitality. And um, down near the bottom of this Marcus and Millichap article, um, there's a little chart here. It, it has professional and business services are um, are still losing losing jobs slightly but but it's definitely far and away a different story from leisure and hospitality and and i can get into the the office market but yeah so there's the chart right there you can see at the top um it's a small picture but trust me (laughs) when i say that leisure and the hospitality is at the top and at the bottom is professional and business services and um you know we've heard a lot about remote working and and what the workplace is going to look like and that's um even with with even independent of the job numbers that that are on the screen right now, that creates some uncertainty for the office market. But then if the underlying employment is being affected by the pandemic, then that creates, that's just an additional kind of yeah, doesn't, and again, doesn't help. I mean, again, I mean, this comes back to like we're talking about, um, you know, gasoline and, and, you know, CPI. I mean, the leisure hospitality took the largest hit last year. It was down yeah. 20%. So, you know, an increase of 2%, you know, it, it's it's coming back, but it's not, you know, it's not totally back to where it was. And where yeah. last year we actually saw an increase in the office, office sector jobs. And so, you know, a little bit of decline in that, in that area isn't yeah. um, too, too surprising. But I think to your point, I think it's this, this recalculation. I think a lot of businesses are just rethinking about the way they do business. And they're saying, well, maybe we don't need this, you know, high salaried individual that, you know, lives, you know, in, in our, the same market as our office, it's going to needs an office. And, you know, we can just hire somebody remotely. Um, yeah. you know, from anywhere in the world to do maybe do their job. And it just, it, it just, again, it's, a uh, it's another example of how, you know, the flattening of the world and globalization, you know, we can get somebody from, you know, a very high skilled, high quality person from the Philippines that can do the job for, you know, maybe not half, but, you know, less than someone that you have to provide an office for and benefits and um, the rest. I, you know, I just heard, I just overheard some, I don't know if it was a discussion here or on the news, someone was saying, and, and I think it kind of rings true. If they're not physically present in the office, it's a little bit easier to 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 replace them with someone you know yeah to, yeah so I I, I I I think so too yeah uh, I heard um it was on a podcast but it was someone saying you know don't if you're saying you're like I'm gonna tell my boss like hey I don't want to I don't want to be in the office I'm never gonna be in the office and you never or if you have the option to come in you never come in like don't be surprised if all of a sudden like you're not as important as you used to be yeah um, if like everyone else is there and you're not there, um, well, you know, yeah, maybe if you can just absolutely excel working from home, 
um, that like good on you and that that's great. But you know, if you're just kind of getting by and you think that like, Hey, I'm just not going to go into work. Well, don't be surprised if they replace you with somebody working in the Philippines or wh wherever. Um, yeah. so yeah, that's true. I've got more to say on that, but <laughs> if it's anything like e-learning, you got to be in the room. It's a little bit better. Oh man. Yeah. The, the e-learning <laughs> is just, it, it's no, it, it's, yeah, it's no, no good. Um, I mean, it's like better than nothing, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's take a look at this, um, national international reports, um, the DLA Piper global real estate annual state of the market survey just came out. Um, you know, we've got this nice map of, um, you know, kind of the top U S cities for investment during the next 12 months. Um, which is interesting. It's a lot of the big markets. It's a lot of the markets that you see um, on the kind of the top of everybody's list to invest. And you got the Raleigh Dur Durham's, the Nashville's, the Dallas's, the Austin. I'm mean, like a big Austin is the Denver's. It, it's yeah. it's really tracking um, the the migration patterns um, up to these different markets. And you know, um, the, again, this is one of the reasons that I'm like, I oh, yeah, please leave. Indianapolis off this list. And again, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. It's like people are investing in New York and DC. And again, this is just money that's, and maybe there's some buying opportunities, but like Chicago, again, it's fine. You know what? Go to Chicago. Don't come to Indianapolis. Like you pay the well, those property and, taxes. And there's another map near the end of that report. And uh, I wanted to layer these on top of each other. It just didn't, I didn't have room for it in the newsletter. Um, but near the end of that, uh, that report on page 19, it, it asks their survey respondents, where's your primary residence? And 43%, um, which is 5% more than any other area is in live in the Midwest. And that is, you can, you, there's a big gaping hole in, in, in the Midwest when it comes to where they're investing, but where they're living uh, is that's, that's where most of them are living. I just think it's, it's so interesting. Southeast 8%, Southwest 2%. But Midwest, forty three percent. Yeah, that that that, that I, I find that very interesting, um, because yeah, I mean, there's so much capital in um, on the coast, but that 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 is interesting. Yeah. Uh, another th three reason I I think I found I think I found interesting in this um, report was you know, in general, people responders are saying they're very confident about the commercial yeah. real estate market. Um, but this, the reasons to be confident or lack confident are the exact same. It's continued rollout of COVID-19 mm -hmm. vaccines. And then what's the primary reason for lack confidence? It's continuing impact of the pandemic. So, yeah. uh, you know, there's, you know, with the second place for confidence is abundance of capital still chasing deals. Um, it's going to keep prices. If there's any kind of decline in prices, there's going to be buyers just swooping right in to pick those up. Um, the, but the, you know, the kind of the buy side is very strong. And I was on a, um, this is anecdotal. But I was on a um, roundtable discussion with multifamily owners um, located in the meth in located in the Midwest, and there was not a single owner on that call that was a net seller at all. Most were all trying to buy, um, and many were saying like saying that I'm not even considering selling. I I'm ho I'm holding on. I'm not even thinking hmm. about it. You know, we're we have a position. We're a, we're a net buyer, but you know, we've got a couple assets that we're going to kind of you know we're, we're pruning the portfolio a little bit. Um, assets that have we've kind of taken the business plans to where they needed to go, and we've got a right great opportunity um, to take some chips off the table and put them into some new deals. Hopefully, that we'll have coming in the very near future. Um, it's interesting. So. Yeah, it's bullish. That was yeah, that was that other chart you scrolled over um, right above that. You know, the it, it's it's trending toward the bull and and a lot less toward the bear. Um, yeah, yeah, so. that's the least market sentiment, which, you know, market sentiment yeah. isn't always right. Um, you know, there was another report saying that, you know, comparing the sentiment last year to now, and it's basically flipped last year, everyone was mm -hmm. saying, you know, let's run to the, you know, let's run to the lifeboats, you know, worst case scenario, it's going to be horrible. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's completely changed. And so they got it wrong last year, you know, could everybody have it wrong this year? Anything's possible. I don't know exactly. No one has anything to point to where, um, 
it would, things would, you know, turn around for the downside um, outside of, you know, something major happening with, um, you know, the, the pandemic, which, you know, at least in the United States, it seems like we are making some decent progress, although vaccine rollouts have kind of plateaued. So that's not great to hear. Um, I was, yeah. I, I was having, um, I was having a breakfast with the CEO of a local um, hospital network. And, you know, he was saying that even at their, their hot, their hospital staff is only 60% um, wow. vaccinated. And he was like, we're in, we're in the healthcare industry. Like someone's going to come in and get infected coming into one of our hospitals or doctor op, doctor's offices. Um, I thought that was interesting. And they, but they are going to, if they, they may have already made the announcement, uh, but they're going to uh, mandate all of their employees be vaccinated. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, and now they're expanding the vaccine to, to younger populations. Um, you know, there's always a lot of talk about how best to um, to convince, you know, hesitant vaccine uh, or to reduce vaccine hesitancy. I think that's a, a I think it's a problem, but it's also um, I, I'm hopeful that as things become more convenient as the vaccine, uh, as it, I think it's a convenience and an accessibility thing uh, for one. You know, you yeah. don't have to drive an hour out of the way to get one. And hopefully as the demand decreases, it becomes a little bit easier for me, for people to take 15 minutes out of their day yeah. instead of 10 minutes out of their day to get a vaccine. But, uh, did, did you hear what the governor of Ohio uh, is planning no. on doing? So I, I just saw the headline this, of this yesterday. I didn't read any of the details, but it sounds like, and I think this is, this is pretty smart. So they're, they're, they're going to basically, they're offering a million dollars. It's like a lottery for everyone who goes mm -hmm. and gets a vaccine. You have a chance to win a million bucks. Ooh, I love it. I yeah. love it. Like, how do you get motivate people? And like, it, yeah. I hope they do it twice. I hope they do it once and somebody wins mm -hmm. a million bucks. Because they'll spend probably tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars on, on the advertising, getting people to go. And like, let's chip off a small piece of that. I hope someone wins and then everyone's like, yeah, I, want, I want a million bucks. All I have to do is get a vaccine. Like you're going to eat, yeah. you're eating McDonald's and you know, you're well, putting all kinds of stuff in your body. You don't know, you know, that genetically, probably genetically engineered beef. You don't you know, you care about an RNA vaccine. Like, you know what that is. Exactly. Well, and that's the same. Yeah. It's the same logic of you're low so probability. That is, it's just like the inverse is like, okay, you like, you like talking about low probability events or thinking about them then we're going to have a lottery. And then that's your low probability event. <laughs> It'll counteract the other. Much higher chance to get a million dollars than you are to have any kind of issue taking the vaccine. Exactly. That's, that's perfect. I roll, love it. roll the, roll the dice. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I like it too. So um, we'll, we'll see how that happens. We, we, we may have offended some of our, our listeners who don't want to get the vaccine, but um, you know, you know, psh, um, go get the, <laughs> go get the vaccine. It's like, what are you, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. What well, do you, you, you know what there is? Live in a hole. There, it, you do get, I got sick for a day, so it's not perfect, but I'm stronger. But do you have any, like, did you like grow any other like appendages or anything or? I wish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So rent payment tracker from NMHC, um, you know, coming in pretty solid, you know, you don't see the variance that we saw in previous yeah. months, um, you know, you know, 2020, like back in December of 2020, uh, you know, 75% rent collections versus 83. Oh, and that was slightly pre-pandemic. So again, I think that honestly, we were talking about was what was going on. Uh, were we already on the track for a recession? Well, you know, the collections weren't that great compared to 2019. Um, but, you know, back now we're, um, we've got 2021 numbers. Um, you know, we are doing, you know, relatively well comparing um, last April at 79.8% collected versus 78, a little bit lower than 2019. But in May, so far, um, we're very close. We're, we're still, you know, a little bit down and, and actually slightly down from 2020. But we're, you know, above last month, and we're kind of moving in, in the right direction. Um, I, I think that this is this is another interesting chart, and I think that we may start to see more of these. Is as we compare year over year, it's going to become difficult to compare this year to to last year. So we'll get we'll get 2019, 2020, and 2021. Yep. Yeah, it, it's almost like you have to you almost have to remove 2020 yeah. because it's such an anomaly. It just messes all of like your data up. But like you can't remove it, but you you really want to. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, Matt. So where do we want to go um, next? What article do you think that we should highlight? Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, let's see, um, if we could scroll down to the 
to the next area where it talks about the commercial real estate markets. I referenced this in the employment numbers about the um, about the office, uh, the situation with with either office defaults or the office market, the the performance, and um, and this analysis by Bloomberg Law has a few interesting charts. Um, that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And and one of them says, you know, which Siri type do you anticipate will see the most defaults? Retail and hospitality are are um, are kind of obvious choices because even though uh, I mentioned those employment numbers were up uh, for retail and hospitality workers and people I think do anticipate a recovery, it's hard not to see the people coming out now um, for retail and and especially I think for hospitality. But um but it's not. But it's not there yet. Twenty twenty, you know, the last year still happened. There are still uh, plenty of establishments and organizations that are hurting uh, enormously because of the pandemic, and they're not, probably not going to make it out of the recovery. Um, yeah. And uh, so the second. The second story is there's another graph underneath on that same article. There's a, a small line graph that talks about delinquencies. And I don't know, you know, the whole story. I'm sure the office delinquencies are maybe, or office rents are maybe handled a little bit differently. And historically they may have the same similar numbers. However, the, if you look at the high delinquency rate for hus, uh, for retail and hospitality and offices down there, um, you know, down there near multifamily, it's, it's relative, you know, it's practically zero. Um, so it, it suggests that the 79% of, of office, uh, I'm sorry, that, that 79% of office, uh, I'm sorry, 79% of retail. Yeah, yeah. 79% of respondents seeing the office, um, yeah. uh, predicting office delinquency, uh, or pre predicting office defaults, that doesn't line up with its low delinquency. And I think that there's another factor and it may be, you know, just the general uncertainty about the workplace. I, I think, I think that's right. I think people are, are just kind of using their, kind of their intuition of saying, well, it can't be good. Um, you know, one thing I'm curious about retail is, you know, I think some retail is going to do, I think, do fine, and some are going to is going to have issues. One thing I'm concerned about right now for retail is the rising um, cost of labor. Um, you're just not getting yeah. people coming back. Um, they're on government, um, you know, stimulus or unemployment, um, and they've been unemployed for the last year, and they're saying, I don't feel like going to, you know, stand on my feet for, you know, eight to 10 hours a day and make just a little bit above minimum wage. Like, I'm good, I'll stay on unemployment as long as I can. And so it's going to for force um, employers to, you know, raise their wages, you're basically competing with the government paying, paying people not to work, which was the plan, but no, we need people to work now. Um, and, you know, they're already gone through a year of, you know, sales that have been slashed. They've had to, you know, they've had to, you know, cut their occupancy or their, um, you know, yeah, their occupancy down by 25, 50% um, to, you know, make social distancing work. Um, and now they're going to be paying everybody more. Um, I think that's going to translate. They're either going to go out of business or they're going to have to charge significantly more for, you know, food, which they already really have. Um, and again, that's just, it's just, you know, multi-tiered effect of, you know, the dominoes of, of you know, one um, decision, one policy move combined with, you know, what just what's going on is just going to, again, it's a story of inflation and increased uh, price yeah. pressure. I, that's what I was, I was talking with someone else earlier this week. Uh, you know, the, it seems like the only thing missing from a real uh, <laughs> recipe for inflation is wage growth. Um, I think that a lot of the difficulty that people have finding employ uh, finding employees is is a business is kind of a business plan problem. Um, maybe restaurants want to raise prices mm -hmm. on on their you know on their food in order to hire in or, in order to hire the help that they get. Yeah. Um, I think that people coming back to work are a little bit scared of uh, you know of, of of contracting COVID, which I think is. It's perfectly reasonable because these are high visible. You know, these are very high visibility. You know, a lot of contact with people. Um, it's something that you that that shouldn't be ignored. But also, like you're seeing, you know, if we're seeing everything but high wages, then no wonder, no wonder people aren't coming back to work. There's there's very little incentive for them to do so, and there's yeah. a lot of disincentive for them to do so. So I think that, and at least this is my this is my hope is you know you see all this pent up demand for retail and for restaurants, and hopefully that that there is a business plan out there that can involve a little bit higher wages. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, 
I mean, the rich have more money. I mean, the rich are getting richer, so they've they, they've got the money to spend. Um, you know, and so you you know we'll, we'll see. Um, but I mean, there is a big demand. I mean, again, I, I see people flocking to restaurants. Um, and in, in certain areas, it's just it's just slammed. And at the same time, I'm seeing help wanted signs and all these. Yeah. I'll just put every single restaurant and a lot of other just stores I go to. It's help wanted signs everywhere. And um. Yeah, it'll be it's, it'll be interesting. It's very simplistic for me to say just up your prices a dollar, but I think that's what what we might start seeing is, you know, they they put the prices up a dollar so that they can pay their workers and this might um unfortunately start the ball rolling for inflation a little bit faster. Yeah. Yeah. No, I it's a I, hard, I, a I difficult I, situation for sure. It is it is a difficult situation, but it, it's you know, it's it's where we're at or where we're trying to at least we're trying to figure out if that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So multifamily trends and technology. So I didn't miss any. I mean, there's a lot of mm -hmm. the, Matt. The problem with these reports is that there's too much good <laughs> stuff. And we've yeah, actually, we've had true. a complaint. We've had little, they're sort not really complaints, but they're like, there's so much in there. They're like, how do you guys put all this stuff together? They're like, it's got to take a lot of time. And so Matt props it's to you. A long time. <laughs> um, but uh, so you got to get through the report. You know, so again, sign up for the newsletter, greatcapitalc.com slash newsletter, so you can actually get this report. Um, but uh, let's highlight um, uh, it, with multifamily trends and technology, what, what uh, really was interesting to you over this past week, man? Yeah, so the headline was about the, the private equity investors and tax changes. I think we have covered that a little bit. Um, we have, I don't, yeah. I don't think that it's worth taking, taking the eye off the ball there. That is a very big you know, it's a it's very big news if this if this is going to happen, um, but I also think that it right now at this at this point it's kind of speculation and there's no real hard and fast movement that has been made yeah. um, for all of these very dramatic uh, policies. So so we'll see a lot more thought pieces in the interim, especially as as plans kind of firm up. But I think that the government has other things to do um, right now than than enact a bunch of tax increases during uh, recovery. That's a good point. That's the concern um, that you're hearing, especially from the Republicans um, and even some moderate Democrats. Uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, you know, he is has a lot of power right now, um, and he is he's basically he's he's not fully on board with all of the proposed um, tax increases, and so most likely we'll not see. I think we'll probably see some increases, but we're probably not going to see the most extreme proposals um, that have kind of been floated out there. Um, and so, you know, how that translates to real estate, again, like you said, Matt, it, it, it's it's unknown. We're going to continue to track it. I would say um, kind of the outlook is better than it was a week or two ago um, after people have been discussing this. But the concern is why would we raise taxes when we're trying to recover? And, and you know, why would we sell? Why would we shoot ourselves in in the foot? And, and, and again, we're so far removed from like any kind of fiscal responsibility and sound money. It's just, it, to me, it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of comical on, e on either side, whether it's talking about taxing or spending, because I'm like, does it even matter anymore? I, I, I'm, I, I don't know. It, at some point you'd think that it would, but if, if we look back at history, um, at least the past 20 years, it really hasn't much mattered much. And if you look at what other countries in the world are doing, they're doing a lot of crazier things than we are. Talk yeah. about you know negative rates, more types of you know quantitative easing, more spending, more debt to GDP. I'm not saying we spend more. I'm certainly not saying we tax anymore. Um, but it, it's all political positioning, yeah. I guess, is is my point. Um, so, all right, um, let's just take a look. Um, Matt, any other great highlights from trends in technology before we move? You know, on? just that headline on on the Fed worrying that low transactions mask mask CRE value. Or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, mask no, that, CRE. That's I think that that's worth noting. I think this is a double-edged sword um, because it's like, you know, you don't make a profit, you don't make a loss until you sell, until you realize it. And so I think, you know, their Fed is, I think they're they're worried, they're, they're speculating that you're not seeing any like posted losses in valuation because no one's selling anything because you don't have the transaction data. And that's what was tough last year during the pandemic is we just didn't have any price discovery because no, because like, you know, there were the buyers out there were like, you know, they were just waiting um, for prices to drop. And they're like, and they were all just talk of, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for some COVID pricing, 
you know, COVID yeah. pricing, COVID discount. We're looking for a COVID discount. And there, the COVID discount was like, you know, zero to 5%. Um, at, at the absolute most, and for more for assets that like were having issues and they needed to sell. But there really wasn't a material, there was no buying anything pennies on the dollar, especially in commercial real estate. Because those who had assets that maybe had um, decrease in value on paper, they're, they wanted to ride this thing out. And unlike past recessions and downturns, there was all kinds of liquidity in the market. You know, um, there was mortgage forbearance. And, um, you know, and that's what really what cra usually leads to crashes in other market cycles is a tightening of credit. Mm -hmm. But and I but the Federal Reserve um, and the banks, they kind of learned something from 2008, 2008 where they, you know, they did reduce credit because it was there. But in that case, there were issues with the assets themselves. You know, the homes, the real estate was overvalued and that was causing the problem. So we said, we're not loaning anymore um, on these risky assets that are you know, kind of going up and down. Unlike the pandemic, it's it's just a, it's this external factor of coronavirus. But it's like, well, no, valuations make sense. And we're going to keep yeah. lending. You know, yeah. you know, we're just going to keep putting money into the system. And so if you were having issues, you could you could get some kind of relief that's kind of buoyed everything up. Now the Fed's saying, okay, that's going on for a while, but you know, some of these assets, probably retail, probably hospitality, probably office, you know, they may have de they may have declined, you know, five to fifteen percent, but it's not being uh, we're still not getting the price discovery because there's so such mm. low transaction volumes. And so there's nowhere to point to in saying, you know, prices are down. 20% because of these sales, you know, hmm. you know, so without a sale to anchor that price, a bunch of unsold, a bunch of unsold real estate or, or could could be artificially high because there's nothing to peg it to. Is that what you're trying to well, say? Well, I mean, you or, can take a paper. I mean, you can you can value something you can put a give it a paper valuation, um, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, it means something okay. if a transaction takes place. So like if you put a re, you know, if you refinance um, and that, I, it, that's you know, kind of pegging a valuation um, or if you sell it, you know, there's there's definitely a price point. You know, that I mean, that's the real price. Even a refinance, that's more of the the opinion of the appraiser and the lender and how much you know what they're going to mm. put on the value. Um, but they're extrapolating those numbers based on actual sales data um, and you know cap rate surveys and, and knowledge of the market. But you don't really have true price discovery until there are sales happening. And sales volume is so low. There was very little sales volume last year. Um, and it were still low in sales volume this year itself. So, hmm. yeah. All right. Well, you know, do you want to dive deeper um, into the Gray Report recap? Well, you know, if you're watching the video, I might have to suggest one way to dive deeper, and that is to get this fancy newsletter for yourself. Again, it comes over into your inbox every Thursday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, packed full of research reports, articles. Again, you notice we only covered we scratched the surface um so stay up to date go to gray capital llc.com slash newsletter to sign up for this or again if you don't know how to read that is fine that's why we make these videos you don't have to, you you can read you can do, you cannot read or can just to supplement to augment your gray report um experience so you know hop on over to our youtube channel um <clears throat> where we have Awesome. That's would be our preview music as I'm sharing our screen. We've got awesome, you know, content, you know, whether that is the Gray Report newsletter itself, this is a little meta right now. Uh, but you know, you can watch the Gray Report newsletter coming out every Friday morning, or you can, you know, hop on over to, you know, other videos that we put out, all kinds of useful stuff. Um, education, get into our strategy, you know, just just you're already watching the video, just subscribe to the channel. It's easy as that. And, you know, if you're interested in taking the next step, learning more about multifamily investing, maybe you want to actually see some of these investment opportunities. The only way to do that is to join the Gray Capital Investment Club. So if you hop on over to our website, graycapitalllc.com, you'll see a little button that says join the club. You're going to click that and you're going to fill out a little bit of information so we can learn a little bit more about yourself to build an investor profile um, and there's all kinds of benefits to joining the gray capital um, investment club it's free to do again you just have to give us a little bit of information 
And one of the immediate benefits that you get for joining the club is you get a complimentary investment strategy session. So that's typically a 30 to 45 minute session um, with myself or one of our investment experts kind of diving into, you know, what you're doing, what your goals and objectives are, and really kind of laying out, let's try to build a plan for your real estate investing um, path, whether that is through syndications, doing your own deals, whatever it is, you know, we will really kind of break it down with you and kind of help you through the process. And you can do as many of those as you want. You know, again, it's absolutely free. We also have the exclusive content. We host webinars. But the most important thing is that you will get access to investment opportunities from Great Capital. So again, greatcapitalllc.com. You'll fill out this quick form. You know, it's kind of fun. You fill out kind of what your preferences are, your objectives. Um, you kind of, if you haven't thought about this stuff, that's why we do it. Is so like really getting you focused on laying out a strategy and objectives to achieve, you know, whatever your specific goals for getting into real estate in the first place are. So hop on over to graycapitalllc.com and sign up to join the investment club. All right. This has been another great episode of the great report newsletter recap, Matt, again, thank you very much for, um, one, you know, putting the newsletter together. It's great as always, but then uh, hopping on with us today and uh, getting through it all. Thanks. It's always fun. Oh yeah. Always a good time. All right. Stay tuned for next week's episode of the great report newsletter recap and do all that stuff. I just told you like this video, subscribe to the channel, hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com. If you're not signed up for the report, get signed up and check out greatreport.com, the new website from Gray Capital. You can get you can just stay up to date more than every Thursday. So it's it's a great deal. All right, everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your week. Great day and happy investing.